All right, hello everyone, and welcome to episode six of Star Trek Mata Hari. It's been a while, so I'll just remind you, uh, we're a tabletop role-playing game, or an actual play, using the Star Trek Adventures rule set. Uh, we are set in the year 2412 aboard an Eclipse class in the Shackleton Expanse. If you are keeping track of quote-unquote canon for my games, we are indeed in the same canon as Fenrir, Groundskeepers, and October. Now, you don't really need to have watched any of those games or even the past VODs of this game to enjoy this session, but you're probably going to have a richer experience if you do. Uh, so you can find the VODs for pretty much everything on my YouTube and most of the popular podcast solutions. But uh, I don't really have much in the way of announcements except for that I'm doing Extra Life uh, for the month of September. Uh, obviously, it's going to stretch into, no into November. Um, but the big thing is, is that 25% of all subs and bits, et cetera, et cetera, that I get for the month of September, I will be donating myself to Extra Life. So if you ever need an incentive to throw bits at me or you want to help the kids out, uh, there are links below the stream where you can certainly do that sort of thing. But uh, with that said, let's just go around and have everyone introduce themselves because it has been a while, starting with the captain. Hello, uh, my name is Dare Wolf. I am playing Captain O'Connor, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, up next, Jaro. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Mikhail, and uh, I play the first officer, Commander Jaro. All right, Prawl, you're up next. Hello, my name is Alex, and I'm playing Lieutenant Commander Prawl, the ship's intelligence officer. And last but not least for tonight, Mr. Jensen. Hi, I'm Jeff, and I'm playing Lieutenant Commander Jensen, the science officer. All right, and with that, let's make sure our intro hasn't broken down on us. And welcome back. So uh, something I like doing for all of my games is having the players do an opening monologue. And tonight, Captain, I believe you have quite one for us. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, if you're ready, I'll take it away. Go for it. All right. Captain's log, start eight eight nine eight three four point nine. I'm at a loss this very moment. While I understand her decision, Marjorie's last communicate to me has left me somewhat empty inside. Were our children younger and not themselves adults with their own lives and careers, I believe she would have chosen to stay with me. How many times did she tell me, though, Fred, your home is in the stars. It was never with me. And if you go back on this ship, some mission, some anomaly, some galaxy changing event will keep you there. And if that happens, I will not be here when or if you return. She was always the most logical of the two of us. And I always joke that she must have some Vulcan in her. But alas, it is done and the papers are signed. With that said, the, the Mani, Manahari's crew has adapted well to their new lives. The events that brought me to this command are months behind us, and the excitement of the cryoneural gel packs has given everyone, including myself, much to focus and rally around. The initial press conferences were taxing, but I am grateful and also thoroughly impressed with Commander Jarl Rion's performances during these meetings. Dealing with my own personal issues, he stepped up, and accordingly, I have issued a commendation in his file and a re recommendation for him to eventually have his own command as soon as the opportunity arises. He is an officer with both that both follows orders as one should and questions when one should as well. This is what a captain desires out of his first officer and what a crew looks for in their leaders. I am lucky to have him. And when he does leave, I will be sad to see him go. 
The integration of the new cryo cryo neural gel packs into our systems has had somewhat unexpected mm, enhancements to our systems. Our computer's efficiency are processing data at an increased level unseen in known history. Genshin gave several briefings on its new efficiency and I'm embarrassed to admit, I only understood a fraction of it. Engineering was always more so my specialty. Science and how computers function, it's a little bit above my pay grade. With that being said, apparently our computer is now the most powerful in the fleet. Deep Space, Deep Space August, I'm pleased to announce, the station surrounding the anomaly has also finally been completed. I'm somewhat surprised though at the lack of Voth presence at the station. A few ships here, a few ships there. Their initial attitude was borderline, dare I say, aggressive towards us. And Prol and myself engaged in a number of diplomatic meetings with the Voth. His guidance and knowledge about their culture, though limited as most knowledge of them is, was invaluable. And smoothing things over, allowed me to smooth things over. Having a, number of Starfleet, having a member of Starfleet intelligence aboard uh, the ship, some captains may see as a hindrance. But I've always said, keep your friends closer and start feeding intelligence even closer than that. With regards to the Voth, both him and I have discussed their lack of presence e extremely. Either they know something that we don't about this anomaly, or perhaps this is not the only presence of the anomaly in the galaxy, and they are performing their own inve investigations elsewhere. Tensors are calm presently, but I do not 100% trust the Voth, nor do I think they 100% trust us. Time will tell. Tola, when I first arrived, I dare say, I could tell was lacking confidence in himself. But as the upgrades of the ship progressed, I was pleased to see him take on more of a leadership role. And with each passing month, there was a slight bit of hesitation decreased, 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 and his nervousness dissipated until I could no longer see it at all. I believe these events and the events of the last several months have solidified this crew. We're ready to once more boldly go, abide it at a short leash into the unknown. We are currently en route to a class N planet, a world where we have received a repeating pattern, specifically ancient Morris code. The code doesn't seem to be a coherent transmission, though if anything, it does seem to be more like a number station. We'll see what we find and log. All righty, and for such a uh, detailed opening log, you may have one momentum. So Thank you. <laughs> uh, we are going to cut to the computer core where we have Jaro, Prawl, and Jensen uh, all going about your uh, sort of maintenance tasks. And uh, I wanted to give you guys a moment of your own to uh, sort of catch us up with where these characters were. Uh, so take it away. Yeah, um, so Commander Jaro actually just got back from a vacation. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a well, a well, a well-deserved vacation <laughs> the, the resort. So, as he's as he's working, he'll just sort of look over at you guys and be like, oh, "Well, uh, how have how have things been on your personal projects since um, since I was gone?" Uh, well, uh, yeah, I uh, Jensen just got back to the ship too because he's actually been working with the Daystrom Institute lately. So. He's actually reviewing all the upgrades uh, since Tolop wasn't here to uh, go over them with him. So I'm having, I'm going through this entire, I've got a stack of data pads next to me that I'm going through meticulously, double checking everything because as good as Tolop is, uh, I have learned we need to triple check everything. <laughs> uh, not saying anything bad about our engineer, but uh, we kind of missed some stuff when we left Space Dock the last time. I think we're off to a little bit of a better start this time around, though. Oh, well, I hope. But I also, yeah, uh, these computer cores are not the ones Kaleo was trained on on the Academy either. That is very true. And, uh, yeah, we did extensive testing over at Daystrom on these things, trying to understand how they were even created in the first place. So and we're still kind of stumped on that. So we have no idea what they're capable of or the limitations. So I just want to make sure that we don't have any kind of repercussions from them later. Fair. If you find anything you're, you're struggling with, I could run something, anything by the Undying during one of our coordinated council meetings. I've been it's been a bit of a struggle getting the Undyne and the Voth willing to speak to us to, 
to work together on planning any kind of defense of this of this anomaly if it came down to it. I mean, the Undying said something about a planet killer and, you know, anything that you can come up with is going to be greatly appreciated. Yeah, it's, it's we just want to be, with any new technology, you got to be careful because we don't want to go full bore and have it do something terrible. So I'm going to probably have some recommendations for some security or same safety procedures be, so that we don't just, let's not put it on full thrusters yet. <laughs> What about you, bro? How have this, how has the uh, politics been treating you? Well, let's just say, personally, I'm glad we're not on the station right now. Between dealing with what we have to with the Voth, my own duties, and the fact that my parents decided to come for the construction of the station with all the new technology, I'm glad to be underway. Your your parents are they uh, are there any uh, um, in Cardassian uh, government? Uh, n no, I, I thought I went over this with you before. Remember, I was an yes, orphan were... from the Dominion War. Sorry, I always uh, always forget that point. So um... no, the my adoptive parents. They both worked at Utopia Planitia. So they saw this as a unique opportunity. I'm glad we're underway. Well, when things get tough, you might, uh, you might appreciate uh, the fact that you got to spend some time with them. Don't get me wrong, it was nice to see them. But it did kind of get in the way of other issues. Fair. All right. So uh, as you all continue to do your various tasks here in the computer core, uh, we're actually going to skip ahead just maybe a few hours, probably towards the end of beta shift, where you're just about to go off shift. And uh, you're basically called into a meeting by the captain to review the details surrounding the class N planet you are headed towards currently. Uh, so as you all walk in to, uh, oh God, there's two prawns. Uh, as you all walk <laughs> in to the uh, conference room uh, located just off of the main CIC, uh, you of course see the captain there, but also Ensign Raven waiting for you there. And uh, yeah, captain, it's your meeting. So just let me know when uh, Raven should give her monologue. Welcome, gentlemen. Hope that everything is going well with the computer core. Um, I don't believe we have any time to waste. Ensign Raven, please take it away. Very well, sir. Uh, she stands up and goes over to one of the wall panels and taps it so that a hologram of the planet appears over your conference table. One of the new upgrades the Matahari got was you basically have the quote-unquote Picard holographic interfaces. So you literally can call up images everywhere kind of a thing um but what's interesting about the planet that's being displayed is of course a few things uh it is a class n and a class n is venus like meaning that it could maybe sustain some sort of an expedition for a short amount of time but sort of harkening back to in real life um our probe to venus lasted what a few hours if that mm -hmm. Um, so it's one of those things where it's definitely not a place you would want to have a facility or have a colony. Um, and Raven sort of looks down at her next bullet point and says, which leads me to my next point. Um, I've been analyzing this Morse code and well, maybe this will make more sense. And she actually plays it over the loudspeakers. And, uh, if anyone, let's have one person roll this actually prowl. I think this would be best for you. Uh, why don't you roll me a insight and security difficulty of zero? And if you have cryptology, if you have um, code talking, anything like that, it would apply as a focus. Uh, what, maybe investigation? I'll give it to you. Uh, 
Hey, three successes, which means you're up to four momentum. Nice. Brawl, you've heard this before. This is a standard SOS sequence. But we don't know of anything that should be here, correct? Uh, and Raven nods and says, that's correct, sir. As far as Starfleet records are concerned, there has never been a Federation or even Starfleet vessel out this direction. And then for stan a standard SOS sequence, somebody's come out this way. Prawl, do you know of any ships that were in this vicinity within the last... Let's go back 10 years. Anything you can pull up? Um, you know, even colony ships, ships that we saw going this way across any of the Federation, um, you know, allied, anybody that we know of. Let me double check in the uh, navigation database. Let me check in our logs. And we can do this one of two ways. Either you can do a difficulty three task to look through all this data, or you can just give me a point of momentum to ask that question. I'll give you a point of momentum. All right. Spend mine. So uh, the answer to that is it's uh, almost 99.9% .9 sure what Raven just said, that there has been no ship traffic in this area. But what catches your attention in the navigational database is an old DY100 class was in this, was headed out this general direction. Now, sort of as a, as a refresher, um, a DY-100 was basically a sleeper ship where they would put a bunch of colonists in there, uh, basically cryogenically freeze them, and they would travel at sublight speeds for centuries, decades, almost millennia even. I know I did that out of order, but you know what I mean. Um, it's one of those things where they might have made it out this far based on the current time frame. But if that's the case, how the hell are they transmitting a Morse code signal now? Hmm. Jensen, I have a question for you. Um, this class V planet, class N planet that we're heading towards, you know, based on my limited knowledge of these planets, I understand, you know, that they are completely hostile. How could a colony ship of this nature survive on this planet? Is that even something that's even possible? Uh, not with the technology they had available at the time there's no way they would have survived um, probes of that era didn't last more than a couple hours so we won't have any so unless they got help from someone else along the way Jaro are you from aware of any wormholes in this area subspace anomalies you know any other species that transverse this area you know have you heard of anything yeah, I mean, I can look into it. Can I make a? Is that? Can I make a check? Yep, it's either a check or just one momentum. Okay, I'll make a check. momentum here. I think. Okay. So, uh, what you're able to find is that the closest ship, if I understood the question correctly, um, is that the closest ship in the area would have been the USS Missouri, a Oberth class. Uh, it was basically doing a sur scientific survey of one of the nearby systems, but not the system you're headed towards. Well, if anyone if anyone doesn't have any other insight into this situation, I guess the best thing to do is just to get there and see what we find. Any other questions? I, I agree. Is there one final question? Is there any way anyone could be spoofing this signal from another location? I would Benson? say because Prawl asked that question earlier, I would say that Prawl, you're 99.999% sure that a human sent this signal. Okay. All right. So it's almost genuinely human in origin. All right. What's the closest scan we have of this planet? Have we had a ship actually do a flyby? Is this all long range data? Have we actually had a ship do a deep scan of this, of this planet or are we the first ship to actually investigate it? I'm asking, uh, are we sure this is truly a class N planet? Right. Uh, Raven speaks up and says, uh, latest probe data, sir. Uh, it's about three years old. So unless something uh, massive has happened to the planet's atmosphere and makeup, then it should still be a class N. 
see what we find. Um, thank you, everyone. You're dismissed. I'll see you at your stations. Um, Jensen, if you don't mind, as soon as you get long range scans, I want that data sent directly to my console. I can. Thank you. Dismissed. All righty. So uh, we're going to do another time skip here to you all arriving at the planet. So let's get everybody back in the CIC where they should be stationed. Let's see. Put Prawl over there. Jensen, you're over here. And we move it so the stream can see what's going on. Excellent. Uh, Titania is not there. But uh, as the planet comes into range, what you see on the holographic viewer in the middle of the CIC is... A strange looking planet now that might seem a misnomer but everything that you are seeing on sensors even with your own visual eyes I know you know what I mean it doesn't make sense so to try and explain what I mean imagine if you will a ball just a standard ball you know squishy maybe a stress ball even it's a solid color and it's mostly spherical well, you're looking at the planet on the view screen and you're almost sure that every once in a while it's as if something compresses the poles together um, and sort of squeezes and causes the equator of the ball or the planet to expand outwards. It's not a huge amount, but it's enough that you're able to see it, which might speak volumes. The other thing that's going on is that what cloud cover there is, what white covers this planet is almost whipped around the planet in almost like a ribbon-like fashion. So you're almost seeing these almost bursts of cloud activity, maybe even a few hurricanes or large weather things where they appear for a few brief moments and then are sort of blown away, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, the third and final thing I would say that isn't sort of, you know, connecting the dots is Venus is yellow, and that's because of its toxic sulfur atmosphere, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. This is a green planet. As far as anyone knows, green doesn't belong on a class N planet. Hmm. Jensen, what do yeah. your sensors tell us? Yeah, we can. I would like to run some scans. Yeah, see see what's going on. Let's uh, let's get our uh, roll going here. That's going to be a reason science. Uh, difficulty of zero after advanced, advanced sensor suites. Uh, if someone could get the ship's sensors and science, please. Yep. Jara, that's you. I got it. There's sensor. All right, so no help from the ship. Huh. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I was looking at my talents earlier. Mm -hmm. And I have, which one is it? I think it's technical expertise. You do. And which allow, if I get assisted by the ship's sensors, I can reroll one D20. And it can be either your die or the ship's die. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do mine because I do have a high reason in science. So, all right. Just, so it's like I started researching my own stuff. So I'll make sure I know what I'm doing. There. All right, there's your one success. So, uh, yeah, your sensors actually aren't able to pierce the atmosphere. They almost bounce directly off, which, again, is odd because you are detecting a signal coming from the planet, that Morse code signal. Uh, Jaro, so how do these scans compare to the scans that we had from the previous ships that, that came by here, the last probe? Uh, the answer to that is that they're the exact same. Nothing has changed. Oh, really? Oh, sorry. I missed that. This is bizarre. Uh, does this mean that we can't isolate exactly where on the planet the signal is coming from? I would say it would be very difficult. Hmm. So just Can we get gravimetric readings off of this planet to see mm. why the poles seem to be compressing? Uh, well, Jensen, uh, you have two free questions, actually. One from high-resolution sensors and one because you're the science officer. Oh, so yeah. what, uh, what two questions should I answer for well, you? Well, I was to say, the, the gravimetric sensor data, is there anything to explain why it's compressing? Mm -hmm. 
and that would be with a fun question. And then I'm kind of very curious about what kind of weather we were seeing going on down there. That the weather could be very interesting. Uh, hmm. So, yeah, uh, right. what kind? Of, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, let me ask this: Do you remember that one episode of Voyager? Uh, where there was that time planet that traveled at an experienced rate of time. Uh, yes. That's almost the exact same thing here, where the planet is spinning so rapidly and the unique properties of the planet's core. Time is passing at an accelerated rate on the planet. Now, you don't know what the time differential is, but you do know that the compression that you're seeing is sort of a natural bleed-off effect of the massive spinning. Now, the second question, uh, repeat it for me just so I make sure I'm saying the right thing. It's just what, you know, well, I think the first question kind of answered the second question. It was the weather, what was going on with the weather patterns so we were seeing because they were visual weather patterns. But that kind of explains it. If it's going at such a high rate of time, that would explain why the weather is so erratic. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, you can uh, change your question. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I can think of one if you don't mind. Go for it. Are there any other planets within this solar system that are exhibiting similar phenomena? And that's on me because I didn't really describe the, the whole system. I focused on the planet. Mm -hmm. So the only other planetoid in the system is a barely a class d uh it's like a mercury near the class k star uh so almost like a soul like star um but it's not doing the spinning maneuver it is quite literally just sort of sitting there uh in i don't want to say midair but it, it's you know just it's a ball of rock nothing special about it um but someone did ask in the chat the gravity on the planet is somewhat earth normal so mm. Yeah, it's it's quite a wonder of science you've got going on here. Well, I'd like to investigate the 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 signal and see if anyone is trapped down there, but not without knowing what we'd be getting into in terms of the time differential. I wouldn't want to risk risk the crew without knowing that much at least. Can we send a probe into the planet's atmosphere and try to get some some sensor readings back from it? You can. Uh, I would uh, I would basically roll something on my end to see how long the probe survived. If, uh, Jensen, what do you think? Can we try it? I, I, I was going to say, I would not recommend any manned things until we have more data, but yeah, a probe would be the best idea. Let's do it. All righty. So I'm curious, uh, we don't need to know the actual class of probe, but are you sending a lightweight, a heavyweight, a medium weight? I think it'd be best to send a heavy probe in. Straight to heavy. Okay. Yeah. Jarl, so, do you agree? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. All right. So I think if I remember my probes correctly, I think that's a class seven or a class eight. Um, so almost like a photon torpedo, the probe launches out from the forward section of the Matahari, and you see it sort of descending towards the planet. And right before it actually touches the atmosphere, what happens is Jaro and Jensen, especially on your two consoles, you're seeing that the torsional stress on the probe is literally tearing it apart to the point where it lasts for maybe another two, three seconds, and then quite literally rips itself apart. Oh my god. Glad that wasn't a shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be honest, crew. I'm at a loss here. Suggestions? Should, should we... We could always try sending a communications signal down. See if we get any kind of response. It's worth trying. I mean... If the SOS signal is reaching us, surely we can get some kind of calm down to down to the point of origin. Well, if you want to try it, we can certainly roll for it. Sure. All right. So my question is, what type of message are you sending? 
And how are you sending it? Well, I have a thought on the second part of it as far as what kind of message that that's maybe for the captain or the first officer to come up with, but the, probably in the same type of signal we received the SOS in. So basically a Morse code yeah. uh, bounce back, okay? That's how I would suggest. I'd agree. Standard, standard May. Doing SOS, I'd say. I'd right. like you to take the lead on this one, Jarl. I just want to see how you handle it. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I'll I'll turn to to Jensen and say uh, set up the set up the signal uh, in the same way that it it came out to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what kind of message would you like to send, Commander? Yes, like you said, uh, we're going to be responding in Morse code. Just. Um, uh, stating that where we uh, we're here in response to the SOS message, uh, what can we do for them? All right. All right. So uh, we are going to uh, treat this like a hailing frequencies open task with a little bit more uh, difficulty than normal. Uh, just bear with me for a second. I have to reopen this PDF because it is not working for me. Do, 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 do. All right. Oh, that's why it wasn't working. Duh, it was on my second monitor. I was like, where did it go? All right, so this is going to be a control and a engineering. And this will be assisted by the ship's sensor. No, communications and engineering. Now, normally... This would be at a difficulty of zero, but due to the unique nature of this planet, it is a difficulty of four. Uh, all right. So, yeah, you might if you might want to spend the, the momentum. I was going to say, do you guys mind if I spend the momentum to buy at least one die? <laughs> because do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So control, engineering. And then assisted by the ships. Communications and engineering. Communication. And then one of the rare times we actually use the uh, communicate our communication system. OK, so I have computers and linguistics. Would either of those focuses apply here? Uh, I'll give you I'll give you linguistics. All right. We got one off the ship here. Cool. Here goes nothing. Three ha -ha! successes. So four total. <laughs> you get what you want. You get what you need, even. <laughs> uh, so let's be very clear here. You're sending back uh, basically an SOS signal that says, hi, we've received. We're here to help. Or yeah. is this more of a uh, just a ping back to show that someone is out there listening? It's it's like we're here to help. Yeah. Okay. So you send out that signal, and almost immediately, what happens is the entire ship begins to shake, and you look at all your consoles, and for the life of you, you're not able to tell, you know, where this sort of disturbance, why the inertial dampeners are freaking out. But what probably concerns you the most. Remember that planet outside your view screen? It's getting mighty large. Shields up. I mean, thrusters full reverse. Get us out of this gravitational like field. All right. So, uh, Ensign Raven, of course, does what she can. Her fingers fly across the console. But even though you see her doing her best, like with sweat dripping down her forehead, she just kind of gives you a look, Captain, that says it's not happening. This is the captain to the crew. Brace for impact. Red alert. All right. So red alert is sounded as uh, the entire ship begins to fall into the planet's gravity well. And the reasoning for that is because someone did guess in chat, the gravity of the planet has changed. In fact, it has spun even faster now. And what happens is the Matahari gets closer and closer and closer to the surface of, or the atmosphere of the planet. 
and you still see see that the stress on the hull is threatening to tear it apart. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll six challenge die, and every effect that I roll will be a breach to your structure. So, survey says, uh, you get four breaches to your structure. <laughs> good. It's always a good way to, to start the, uh, the, the first session back of, from a break. You know, just here's, here's four breaches for you. Uh, but that also does mean I now have to roll four challenge die to see if anybody's knocked out. Okay. So, as the ship, as it buckles and breaches and sort of vents atmosphere out into space and to the atmosphere of the planet... Um, consoles spark all around you. The bridge is shaking un uncontrollably. Panels and consoles are breaking apart. The regulation rocks and the ceiling are falling. Uh, it's not a good <laughs> scene. Um, but what really probably catches everyone's attention is Ensign Raven is literally thrown over her console from a explosion underneath of her. And she goes skittering unconscious over here next to the hollow table in the middle. And then same sort of thing happens to Zonsa, where she tries to say, Capt, and that's all she says before she, too, is flung oh. over her console, slamming into the wall behind Jaro. And as you sort of continue to fall towards the planet, um, you know, you are probably all sort of gripping onto something as the altimeter sort of counts down very ominously from 400 feet or 40 thousand feet 30,000 feet 20,000 feet can I dive towards the the control console and try to stabilize the ship you can as, it would be very as difficult any, as any heroic captain would like I would like to spend one determination to mm -hmm. activate spirit of discovery okay to give myself four momentum and I'm going to scream back at Jaro check Ensign Raven and I'm going to attempt to stabilize the ship and engage our um, landing gear and try to land us somewhat safely, but probably not going to happen. We'll see. We'll <laughs> All right. So yeah. what I would say is that this will be an extremely difficult task. Um, normally, I would say it would be a five. But I think this is one of those rare opportunities where difficulty six is warranted. Fair. Uh, what do I need to roll? So you would be rolling a daring and a con. And the ship will assist you with an engines in a con. All right. I would like to spend all of that momentum. Mm -hmm. um, plus give you a th two threat. Because that would give me what? Five, that would give you five dice. dice. Five dice. Okay. And I have a helm operations. So I would have would a focus. Apply. And I will say, crew, pray to whatever god you believe in. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to do a daring. Oh. And then engine's gone for the ship, right? Correct. All right, so daring. Well, there's a uh, assist from the ship. Cancel, cancel. My character sheet decided to crash. Hold on. All right. The ship assisted. They get a one. Mm -hmm. All right, ship, let's go. Okay, uh, so I'm doing a daring, and I'm doing con, mm -hmm. and I'm praying to my gods. <laughs> and I'm rolling 5d20? Yep. You can do it. <sighs> oh, so Ooh. close. So ah, you're at right. four. Uh, now let me ask this, because it has been a while. Do you have veteran? I do. Well, this would be a very good time to roll an effect on a challenge die for you, because that would give All you right. your determination back. Ooh, let's do it. Do I roll the die? Yes, you do. Uh, just one? Just one. <laughs> uh, it oh, come back. no. <laughs> I tried. Oh, man. So uh, let's let's talk about our options here. Yeah. Uh, one option you have is challenging a value. Um, remember, you'd have to sort of count, yeah, cancel out that value and replace it at the end of the session. But that would give you a, a determination. Um, I would like to challenge my find it before it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being, because it's usually Captain O'Connor, because of his experience, he he usually likes to just have everything sorted out before it even like becomes an issue. This mm -hmm. is a moment where he has to think on his feet more because he's more of a calculated captain. 
So mm -hmm. I'd like to challenge that and likely replace it at the end of the session with like something along the lines of think on your feet or, um, you know, like calm under fire or something like that. Like you'd have to be, he's having to like adapt to more challenging like situations where he can't prepare. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's perfect use of that. So yeah, so you have a determination now. You can re-roll as many of those dice except for the ship die as you wish. All right, guys, work with me here. What should I do? Should I roll like three of them or just the two zeros you just roll the two zeros i think just the two zeros yeah, just all the right. two all right here we go daring con two dice focus i don't ask for much <laughs> help me out here Yes! Yay! Yay! We, did it, we did it! All right. There you go. Momentum, Excellent. Right? Got a so back. <laughs> that is a grand total of seven successes, which means you actually get that point of momentum back. So, uh, Captain O'Connor, you leap over the console, and in a display that will probably go in the history books, you basically pull off what is essentially going to be known as the O'Connor maneuver, uh -huh. where what you do is you vent the drive plasma from the nacelles and ignite it to provide literally a reactive cushion of air underneath of the ship. And you are able to control this explosion such that when the Matahari finally hits ground, that it's enough that you all feel it and you maybe start to strain the landing gear on the Matahari. But after a moment, everything comes to a stop. Damage report. I'm uh, I'm uh, still looking at Zonza and uh, Raven, making sure that they're okay. All right, they are lethally injured right now, so somebody needs to do first aid on them. Uh, what are the natures of the injuries? Uh, they are dealing with a lot of plasma scarring and concussions. Is, I, I assume there's some medis, medical kits on the bridge. Yeah, there's definitely right. medical kits on All the right. bridge. Uh, yeah, okay. I can administer first aid. I have okay. decent medicine. <laughs> now, uh, what I'm going to do here is be a little bit evil. I'm going to spend two threat to say that whichever one you don't treat first is going to get worse. Uh, okay. I'll, uh, let's see. I guess I'll go. To, uh, I'll probably go to Raven first, just because we need captain. We don't need the captain to fly all the time. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. Uh, so what's the uh, what's the? What's it the is a control and a medicine here. Difficulty uh, of one. Cool. Control medicine. I do have emergency medicine. Most definitely would apply. Yeah. Nice. Not Four eight. successes. So sure. I believe you're up to five momentum total there. Yeah, yeah, you can get Raven up and at them. Uh, she's, of course, a little bit bleary and, you know, holding her head. And But she, you know, comes to consciousness. Her eyes flutter open and she says, uh, did, did we make it? Are we landed? We're on the ground. Okay. Uh, just take it easy. Uh, don't, 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 don't stand up too quickly. No, I, I quite like the floor. It's nice and comfortable. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to go over to Sansa and take a look at her injuries. See what All I right. Can do. So what's happened in the time it's taking you to treat Ensign Raven, Zonsa has gone almost pale white in color. So the reason for that is very obvious. When she hit her head and it sort of cracked her skull, there is some bleeding there. Okay. without going into too much detail all right uh so i'm gonna look over and so we need to get her to sick bay immediately have the emh prep the surgical suite and i'm gonna try and triage it temporarily just to get her there all right so you have two options here or at least the way i see it feel free to suggest your own um but you can either do the transport task straight to to sick bay that would be fairly straightforward mm -hmm. um you can also try to stabilize her um but again it will be at a higher difficulty than before 
I think uh, probably best to transport her directly to sick bay where they have better tools to stabilize her quicker than this first aid kit I have. Okay. So, uh, who would be taking the transporter task on? Any volunteers? I, I can do it. Okay. So, Jaro, you're going to be rolling a control and engineering. The ship would normally assist you with sensors engineering. However, as you call up the transporter systems, you see that the main computer's down right now. So, it's not going to help you. Sure. What is the what is the difficulty on this one? The difficulty will be a three. All right. Then well, we're maxed out on momentum, so take it. Pretty low, so if your engineering is better, you might want to. My engineering is two. <laughs> I've got three. Yeah. Okay. You, somebody Mine, else. Yeah. We're we are also maxed out on momentum, so you guys feel free to use what you need. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Prowl should should handle this one. Mm -hmm. All right, I will do this. Can I get one of you to assist me in modulating the transporter wave to make sure we keep a lock on Zonsa? Uh, uh, we're, yeah, I can do it. All right. So yeah, Prawl, control engineering, difficulty of three. And then Jensen, you'll be assisting with your own control engineering. All right. All right, and I would like to use one momentum to gain an extra die. Okay. All right, there's okay. an assist. And would survival count as a focus on this? Um, I'm going to say no, unfortunately, but good try. What about composure? I could see composure working because you do have to keep your fingers pressing the correct buttons. Otherwise, someone could die. That is, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, what's the expression? Something under fire? But uh, cool under fire, that's what it is. Calm under fire. Calm under fire, that's mm -hmm. what it is. Uh, so five successes, which means you get two momentum, which I would say you're already a cap. You probably want to just spend that two momentum right away to create an advantage here. Um, but even without spending to create the advantage, you get her to sickbay and the doctor will work on her. Nice work, Prawl. It's good to be prepared in times like this. All right. Um... And what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend two threat that it's right about then that the bridge lights flicker and completely go out. So you're now on emergency backup power. Hooray. You are muted, Wolf. <laughs> Captain Demand Engineering, what's the stat what's the status of the warp core? And uh Lieutenant Commander Tuleyev responds, Captain, we are having great problem keeping main engineering online. Do what you can. Please keep us posted. In the meantime, um divert all unnecessary power um to life support and um ship stabilization. Very good, sir. I, I am having a question, though. What in the world did you end up hitting? A planet. I'm sorry, what? We'll talk about it later. Just get the ship back up and running. We need power. Aye, sir. Yeah, um, my, I suggest we get everyone, uh, everyone um, life support units, life support suits, um, I think that we might be experiencing the atmosphere of the planet soon. Excellent idea. See that it's done. All right. I'll get to work on that. So Jensen, now that you've done triage and Prawl, now that you've gotten the transport off, uh, what are you two doing while all this is happening? I, I'm going to try and set up a distress beacon. Okay. To say, uh, I need to take a probably do some kind of sensor sweep to see what's going on and see if we can identify anything else on the planet where that's going on because obviously the signal's coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now that we're on the planet, we might have better luck finding it. Mm -hmm. I also need a casualty report sent directly to my station as soon as possible. I want to know how many crew members are injured, set up a triage. I'm sure there's more injuries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So, uh, Prawl, let's start with you. So that distress beacon, or this distress signal you're trying to send, tell me a little bit about its composition. Uh, trying to set up a uh, subspace signal, see if it'll even leave atmosphere. And what I would say is that even without needing to do a task, when you try to send the ping, what you fear happens is it pings off the atmosphere and comes straight back down. Mm. So knowing that and knowing what we do about that Morse code signal, I'll try modulating to have something like that sent out instead. Okay. So you switch from sub uh, subspace to literal radio waves. And yes, the radio waves get through. But remember, radio waves are um, speed of light. So it's going to be a while before somebody finds, or not finds, but hears you. Then let's go to Mr. Jensen. So Mr. Jensen, uh, when you go to scan the planet, uh, we're actually going to change scenes here because I had a little something prepared for this. So, uh, as you look outside on the viewer, it's that sort of standard alien planet backdrop that we see in every single Star Trek episode ever. Um, but it is very much a uh, Venus-like surface where you have rocky outcroppings of sulfur and you have geysers of acidic water. The skies overhead are tinged in orange, almost a red. The thick cloud cover is almost raining down acid moisture. Um, and probably what catches your attention most of all is that, and let me actually put the Matahari here so you guys know where you are. Um, so if the Matahari is here in this little canyon, if you were to look up to the highest ridge right about here, you see that there is the tail fin of a DY-100. Really? How interesting. The fact that it's still here is impressive. Why is it still here, though? Can we get any short-range scans of that vessel? Figure out what kind of condition it's in? You certainly may. It will be difficult because, again, main computer is offline, but you might be able to do it. So, Jensen, I need you to do a reason and a science at a difficulty of four, but the, com the ship is not able to assist you on this. Okay. Reason, science, difficulty of four. Uh, I would like to spend some momentum. All right, you've got five of it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I know I definitely want to get, I think, two. Two pi okay. will help me. So. so it'll be a total of three momentum. Okay. So that will get me 4d20. I still have focus. Because I have sensor operations, so mm -hmm. look at that five successes. You get a point of momentum back. There you so, go. So remember how I mentioned earlier that the planet looked green? Well, mm -hmm. let me ask this: Are you at all familiar with the Genesis device? Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that the moment you scan and you start to see that there's anything related to the Genesis device the computer immediately locks up and refuses to give you any further data, but you've seen enough. You know that somehow, against all odds and all known data, a Genesis device was being carried by this DY-100. Uh, Captain? Yes? Uh, we have definite evidence of a Genesis device in the area. I'm sorry, what? Uh, Genesis device, uh, terra, uh, ancient Earth terraforming technology. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I am not as familiar with this device as I probably should be. Um, what can you tell me? Uh, so it was a, it was an attempt to make more Earths when we weren't sure recycling technology was going to catch up and save our own planet. So we designed these technology and sent refugees out with them, and they would create, terraform a planet to contain human life. It could be why this DY-100 has survived on this planet so long. 
I mean, that in itself doesn't seem like a bad thing. Were there any drawbacks to it? Um, well, uh, there were, it became almost a weapon at times. It would destroy everything already on the planet that was organic and recreate it. So it would erase what already existed in yes. place of something that would support us. So it's almost like a doomsday device. Yes, and it was treated as such. Dear God. Is there any evidence that this device has been used in any way? Uh, unfortunately, the computers are no longer responding. You do have a free question, though. You are a science officer. Yeah. So was there, is there any evidence that it has maybe been opened or started? I'll give this to you as your free question. You maybe zoom in on the tail of the DY100, and what you see is um, almost like a, a film being fast-forwarded, like a VCR tape being fast-forwarded, where the Genesis device or presumed Genesis device um, it causes sort of vines and other greenery to sort of crawl up the sides of the tail. But remember, you're on an accelerated time span here, meaning that as soon as the vines get to the top, they wither and die, and the process just starts over and over and over. Almost like, a, you know, the whole... I'm trying to remember the name of the figure. The guy that pushed the rock up the hill and then, the, you know, oh, yeah. would roll back down. Is it Sisyphus? Yeah. Prometheus? Prometheus, maybe? It's Sisyphus. Is yeah. it Sisyphus? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, basically, the old thing where the Genesis device is trying to basically work, but the time differential here is playing such havoc with it that mm -hmm. by the time it does any work, it's reversed immediately. Okay. Yeah. So it would normally have already taken over the planet, but the time differential seems to be causing the problem. So what are our options? I need suggestions here. Well, we're, it could be that there are actually humans on that DY100 because of the Genesis device. How long has that DY100 been here though? Well, based on the aid, it's been centuries. So we could be dealing with well, we don't know with the time differential. We don't know what generation of humans are on that ship. If there's if we, anyone still alive. And if we exit this ship and go to that ship, how will the time differential affect us? Will we wither and die? I'm watching we, the Genesis we, device. Yeah, we, well, yeah, based on what we're seeing, could we estimate what the time differential is? Uh, yes, if you give me a momentum, I will answer that question. I will give you a momentum for that because I think that's something we all need to know all right so it's actually something strange as you're looking at the time differential um something on the order of one minute is equal to six hours when you're exposed to the elements but what you're noticing is that the Matahari's hull is not being affected by this process in fact as you look at that a little bit more in depth what you're seeing is that your cryoneural gel packs, the ones you just got, the ones, you know, the brand new things you've just installed, they are generating what is essentially a temporal force field around the entire vessel. Hmm. Oh, neural gel packs. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, so we would have to modify something to get us to that ship so that we're not impacted by the temporal could you modify a shuttle? It's possible. Uh, I think we could try probably make that work. Do we still have power to our transporters? Uh, I would say at this point, you maybe have, if we want to actually put a number on it, uh, you would have three power remaining right now. I want to save that if we have to, when we eventually try to get off this planet, um, assuming that Toleap is not able to fix main engineering. Jensen um, and Prawl, or not Prawl, sorry, Jensen and um, Jaro, I want you two to start working on a plan to modify one of our shuttles as a short-range vessel to get over to this other ship so we can try and investigate what's going on there. And then Prawl, um, I'd like you to 
head up any sort of damage um, report on what's going on with the vessel and have it on my desk within the hour. I need to know what the st status of the Matahari is. Um, and let's all reconvene back in the conference room um, inside the hour. Understood? Aye, sir. Aye, aye sir. All right, dismiss sir, it. Yes. I just want to say thank you for your quick action. Uh, you might have saved our lives. I know any, any of you would have done the same had I not been there. It's just what a captain does. Thank you. All right. And on that note, I think we're going to take our 10-minute break. So, stream, we will be back in 10 minutes. Stick around.
and welcome back to uh, part two of session six of Mata Hari. If you're uh, just tuning in, the Mata Hari has been, shall we say, crash landed on a planet that is quite literally out of time and maybe holds a deadly secret or two is what I would say. Uh, but where we sort of resume is probably a few hours later after everyone has had time to uh, work on their various tasks. Uh, the captain did request that everybody meet him in the conference room. So that is where we rejoin our characters. So take it away. Commander Prawl, status report. Main computer is still locked out from our last scan earlier. Warp core is, from what I gathered, going to take a long time for totally up to be able to fix. There are breaches along the port side of the ship, several on the ventral dorsal. We're in pretty rough shape. What's the good news? I may have thought of way to get a signal back to Deep Space August. I wanted to run by you because it will require a transport. Let's hear it. If we can modify one of our probes to send a signal back, we transport it out into orbit to what we hope is a safe distance. We can let them know what's happened and see if they can send somebody. What's the risk? What happened to us might happen to them. Jarl, what do you think? I think it's a good idea, but maybe we should investigate first before drawing anyone else into it, into this. If the investigation fails, then maybe at that point we'd have nothing to lose uh, and, 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 and sending a signal would be our best bet. That's a great segue into my next question. How did the refix come along for you and uh, you and Jensen? Sure, so I'll, I'll, I wanna ask the GM here whether what we were doing is, is possible. Remind me what that is. We wanna modify one of the uh, shuttles with the new cryo gel packs so that they will be protected from the temporal anomalies. Gotcha. I, I thought as much, but I wanted to be extra sure. So I have good news and bad news. Which would you like first? Bad news first. Bad news. In order to successfully install a gel pack on one of your shuttles, you're going to have to take it from an already active system. So you need to, you, you would have to tell me what system you're pulling the gel pack from, um, which might have effects on your power and how systems operate in the future. Um, the good news is that once you put a gel pack into a shuttle, you not double, you don't triple, you don't quadruple, you like logarithmically scale the processing power of that shuttle in addition to the uh, temporal negation effect. Hmm. So let's see. But uh, as someone has pointed out in chat, it does mean that whatever you pull the gel pack from, that area of the ship is no longer going to be shielded. Let's just take it from life support. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Say, yeah. How about the, well, uh, I was trying to think of, we could always take it from the nightclub. <laughs> there you go. You come back to the nightclub. It's like that scene in Last of Us where you just sort of enter into the building and it's just run down and vines growing everywhere. And... I'm just thinking of a non-essential system right now. Right. Um, I mean, everything feels essential, but navigation maybe right now isn't. Well, yeah, I, I, mean, was just, I was thinking the nightclub because probably not a lot of entertainment socialization going on right now is is with, does that count as a system 
Unfortunately, no. It can count as a location uh, yeah. that will get nuked by the temporal eddies, but it does not count as the system. Could you go through a list of the systems? Yes, uh, they are the same ones that are on the ship sheets in addition to a few others. So let's just go over those very briefly. Um, so of course you have engines, pretty straightforward, warp core, EPS conduits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, computers, which is, I think, again, I sort of, a, it says what it is on the tin. Uh, you have weapons, so phaser rays, torpedo launchers, shielding, things like that. Structure, um, literally your emergency bulkheads, your force fields, your deflector array. Sensors, pretty much what it says on the tin. And then you have communications, which is your subspace relay and things like that. Um, what's not on here, or actually what is sort of hidden, uh, life support is under structure. And uh, the holodex would probably fall under uh, comms, I would believe. What if we take it from our cloak? That is something you can do. Um, you can that. you can cannibalize idea. your cloaking device, but what I would say is that there is a risk, meaning a high complication range, that whatever you do to the cloaking device disables it permanently. Hmm. I don't really want to do that. Oh, I was going to say, comms are kind of useless as long as we're on mm -hmm. the planet. Even our other... Our other plan for communication relied on probes, not the ships. Yeah. Yeah. So if I was gonna suggest anything, it would be that too. Have we tried sending a communication to the other ship yet before we cannibalize it? Not to my knowledge. No, we haven't. I mean it's worth it. It's it's worth a shot. I'd just say I also thought it was worth a shot to send a communication down to the planet. And this was the result. Yeah. There's no way you could have known. I I understand that. It's just hard not to, not to feel like I, someone should have seen this coming. Uh, well, those That's are, it. I mean, we can absolutely try. Uh, and if we don't get a response, then we can absolutely cannibalize the comms for now. Let's make it happen. All righty. So let me be clear here. Are you sending a signal to the DY-100? Yes. I would say yes. We're going to send that signal first before we take the gel packs out. All right. Follow-up question. What message are you sending? Captain. <laughs> Greetings. Uh, this is the captain of the USS Manahari. Is, is, is any, can anyone hear us? All right. So we're going to do a tone shift here, and this is sort of the big moment of the episode, so hopefully it goes off without a hitch. <laughs> All of you are on the DY-100. You are yourselves. You are Connor. You are Jaro. You're Jensen. But you're not actually those characters. Instead, you are the Mirrorverse version of yourselves. Oh. And you oh. have just gotten a communique from your ship, the ship you plan to take over. You're getting a signal from them. What is it that you do? Jensen, do not respond. <laughs> Send them an SOS Morse code. <laughs> Tell them that we're in trouble and need help. Of course, Ooh. sir. Even, even better, perhaps we offer them some sort of way off the planet, uh, uh, if they uh, if they if they come here, how devious! This is why I've always liked you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying. <laughs> no, I love it. Go for it. <laughs> As I say, we could. Uh... Are we the evil versions of ourselves? Because yeah. I'm going full evil. All yeah, right, I mean, yeah, we could. All right, yeah. Uh, we could lure them to <laughs> lure them to our own ship, saying we need medical attention or some of other. Don't they respond. Seem... Let their curiosity get the better of them. They'll come here on their own. <laughs> Excellently stated, Prawl. We know ourselves better than ourselves. <laughs> I don't know. This is I, awesome. I believe that if we if if they think that we that the way off lies here, 
the way off this planet, the way of survival lies here, they'll be willing to risk a lot to, to come get As Prawl said, should we wait for them to come to us or leave them a breadcrumb trail to come here? Let them come. They won't suspect anything. For all they know, everyone here is dead. We lie, we wait with weapons. When they get here, we know how to take care of it. Excellent. You devious scoundrel, you. <laughs> I don't think they moo ha ha in the mirror universe, but I could be wrong. But I love it all. The I same. don't know. I guess I, I I feel like I feel like my mirror universe does, but I don't. know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe. I mean, you know. Cool. All right. I, so I, like it. I think what happens is we switch perspectives back to the actual crew, <laughs> and you get a message back that says, "If I understood the conversation correctly, it says we have injured. Please send assistance." If I understood correctly, I believe the evil crew, the mirror crew, had said that they weren't going to send any signal back and let their curiosity get the better of them, and they would just come and not suspect anything. Yeah. Yeah. All I right, think that was that's why that that's role? that's why I asked. I that was the ultimate yeah. decision. I know we tossed around several ideas. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wanted to be sure. So you do not get a signal back. Well, we didn't get a signal. Uh, I think we just move ahead with the plan. Yeah. I mean, at this point, it would be surprising if anyone still existed aboard that vessel after hundreds of years. Um, but perhaps we can find something to assist us with getting off the planet. Or maybe everyone in agreeance? Okay. Agreed. Yeah. There might be something over there that shows how this ship ended up here in the first place. They might have more detailed research on the planet itself, too. Mm hmm. Let's assemble an away crew. All right. So all the senior officers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that is sort of my question, though. Who is uh, going on the shuttle? Uh, I, I think... assume Jensen was going because. Yeah. All right. We've got Jensen. I, w I mean, I think I would I would like to lead the away mission if okay. that's. If that's fine with the captain, because the captain I suggests just that. He says, I'd like you, uh, Jaro, to lead the away mission. I'd like you to take um, Jensen and Paul with you. I'm going to work with Tolayep uh, aboard the Matahari to continue with repairs and help coordinate, um, you know, uh, med teams and recur crews aboard the ship. Please keep in constant communication with us. And then I'll just take over like a red shirt NPC for the away mission. Yeah, let's uh, let's get you a uh, security here. So unfortunately, Zonsa was uh, knocked out by the whole structure breaches. But I believe we have uh, is it Danny Bradish? Is he security? Oh, old Danny Bradish. Yeah, I got Danny Bradish over here. Yeah, he, you know he's he's a security officer. He's from Brooklyn. You know he's a pretty well, cool guy. I, I think I have to give you a momentum for actually doing the accent. Yeah, come on, Danny. He's like, oh, oh, finally, I get I get some squeak time. You know, okay, I've been sitting here in the, in the, in the security. Nothing bad has happened. Then everything oh. goes to crap. Okay, come on. Oh, but I remember that one. Yes. Captain, can you yeah. spare anyone other than Danny? Oh, no. Danny is one of our best security members. He's definitely coming with you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Captain knows when to use me. <laughs> nice. Oh, Lord. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> no, I love it. You're perfectly fine. This is going to be <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> All right, so uh, you, I've got everybody going over. Now the question is, are you bringing any non-standard equipment with you? Meaning, do you want to use your momentum to buy any special equipment? It's your mission, Jaro. Yeah, I mean, um, what, would, what would be non-standard? So would hazmat suits be non-standard? Um, I would say based on the nature of your mission and the nature of this planet that you could have an environmental suit for free. Okay. So now that's important because an EV suit confers a, I believe it's two resistance if I remember correctly. Uh, no, only one resistance. Okay. Everyone, every member of the, the mission outfitted with an EV suit would be my. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's no cost. 
And then other than that, I, I defer, I, I, can, I mean, do either of you guys have any ideas? Um, well, it, it, it might be good to take a samples kit with us so we can gather some samples while we're investigating. I don't know if that's non-standard or not. Um, I would say that that's probably standard with your tricorder. Um, mm -hmm. Let me give you an example of something that you might take. Um, you might take tra transporter enhancers, maybe. I was uh, going to recommend that. Yeah. Let's see what else you could take. You might take uh, some form of a holographic imager. I don't know why, but you might. Mm -hmm. uh, you might sort of take a uh, emergency transpo transponder. I can English today. Uh, you might also take maybe an upgraded weapons. Maybe instead of type twos, you take type threes. Yeah. Let's take some type threes. Dan Danny Bradish wants his type three phaser. <laughs> All right. Now, what I would say is that the phaser threes are momentum one, threat two, but everybody on the away team would get them. That's cool. Unfortunately, given what our knowledge is of what this mission is, I feel like the the, the transporter, um, the the transporter equipment would be what I would think would be the most. That and maybe the emergency transponders as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, You're I would say officer on this mission. Yeah. How to say this? So I think looking at the opportunity costs, if you want the type threes, the pattern enhancers, and the emergency transponder, that's going to eat all your momentum. I don't think we need the type threes. We're not expecting any armed conflict. No. No. And even if we were, we'd be expecting. I I feel like we'd be expecting something that not... our type twos could handle. Mm -hmm. Right. We're not going in expecting any hostile activity. We're not expecting the Borg. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So I believe that is uh, only a two momentum cost, so you have one left over. All right. So uh, sort of narrative feel here for a bit. So you all pile into the uh, retrofitted shuttle. Uh, you take out of the uh, rear, sh uh, real, uh, rear shuttle bay out of the Matahari and sort of bank towards where the DY-100 appears to have crashed. And you have to do a little bit of fancy flying. Um, so my question is, who would be at the con? No. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, me, I think, unless you have a, um, unless you're good at this, Jensen. I got a con of three, so. I think I that means you are our winner. All right. Uh, fortunately, Radish I took a can help. He has small craft and daring and decent con. I was going to say, fortunately, I did take the focus in small craft. Oh, but Jaro has four. Yeah. Oh, Jaro, you can do it. I can assist if you need me to. Sure. That would be helpful. Okay. All right. So you guys are rolling a control and a con difficulty of two. All right. I don't think I have a focus, unfortunately, that matters here. So. Well, I got you a success. <laughs> okay, yeah. three successes, which means you get a point of momentum. So what happens, oh, I forgot to put you on the screen. So what happens is you bring in the shuttle over the DY-100, and you see that the access hatch, the airlock, is actually still intact, and it's it's positioned on such on the hull that the Genesis device is not actively, you know, covering it up or destroying it. Um, so you could conceivably dock directly with this airlock. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and do it. All righty. So uh, as you do so, we're going to cut back to your mirror universe selves, uh, specifically uh, Evil Bradish, Evil Jensen. <laughs> Evil Prawl and Evil Jaro. There's Evil Prawl. And there's I'll make him evil in a second. But yeah, uh what do you you are aware that your duplicates are about to come through that airlock. What would you like to do? I mean I wanna prepare my type three phaser. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. 
Um, I think I'd want us positioned sort of out of sight. So like using, um, using debris, other material to sort of like be hunkered down under so that um, we'd, we'd have the a tactical advantage in terms of the, the positioning and environment. All right. And so it shall be. So uh, back to the normal away team. <laughs> Us, but like I have to inhabit his, his you team. have to yeah <laughs> so back to the normal away team uh the airlock cycles you're saying that there is a breathable atmosphere on the other side of the airlock Danny's just really excited about his first away mission nothing bad's gonna happen so I, I am I mean Jensen was coming over here because he thought there might be people here anyway so he's gonna be scanning all right. To see if there's life forms aboard. So, Jensen, I'd like you to roll me a reason and a science, a difficulty of two. Okay. Reason, science. Two successes, which is all you need. So uh, what you notice is that, yeah, you are seeing humans, Cardassians, Bajoran. Wait a second. (laughs) There shouldn't be more anything but humans on this DY-100. Commander, getting a lot of life forms that Mm -hmm. don't make sense. I'm just going to shout into, into the ship. Like, uh, is anyone here? We're responding to your distress signal. All right. So, again, we have a POV shift. What do the evil versions of yourselves do? Watching Commander Jara. Uh, spoof a voice like, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm injured. Uh, you know, just lying there, it's like, like, uh, we've, we've had heavy injuries. Please, we, we need immediate medical, medical help. All right. I need evil Jaro to roll me a presence and a command difficulty of two. This is out of control. Also, I hope this whole Mirrorverse thing was uh, is working out. Like, it's one of those it. things that I wanted to try for the longest time, but I wasn't sure if it would go off. So I'm glad you guys are really taking to the spirit of it. Love it. I, in terms of foci, mm-hmm. I regular Jaro doesn't, but I feel like Evil Jaro would. Uh, evil- yeah, I would think Evil Jaro would have a focus here. Something in Deception, at least. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so I see two successes, which means, yeah, so normal away team, you hear uh, what sounds to be a dying woman, dying man. It's really hard to tell, but somebody's dying over there. Yes, they are. Bradish, um, being the brash New Yorker that he is, he's like, Commander, there's an injured person over there. I'm going to go investigate and help him. And he's going to make his way into the ship, like, going to look for somebody. I All right. Mean- Okay, yeah. Evil uh, evil away team. You see Bradish walking through the corridors of the DY100. What do you do? Hey, where are you? I'm here to help you. All right. Give the I give the 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 order to like take him take him down. Oh take man, him. poor Bradish. All right. So, one. who's going to take the first shot? Evil Bradish? I was going to say, I think Evil Bradish should take the first shot. shot. (laughs) shot. (laughs) He had his type 3 phaser ready. He He is ready to go. (laughs) All right, so Evil Bradish, I need you to roll me a uh, control security difficulty of two. All right, let's see here. Control security. And because I find it funny, you may have one of my threat to roll three dice. I love you. (laughs) (laughs) You're amazing. Control security submit 3d20 
Mm. Applicable focus. He does yeah. have phaser use. Oh, yeah. Oh! So Bruce. I get a threat back. I get a threat back is how that's going to work. And uh, yeah, Bradish, I now need you to roll me nine challenge dice. Oh, God. Yikes. Oh, Bradish is about to get messed up. Rip, All right, let me go rip. over the... Uh, where's the challenge dice? Here they are. Roll... Oh, I think I did it wrong. Uh, yeah, we, oh, that was one. Okay. Uh, boop. And then you said nine? Yep. Roll eight more. <gasps> All right. Oh. So what oh. happens is Bradish, regular Bradish, ru runs forward trying to find the injured, quote-unquote, individual. A doppelganger of Bradish pops up from behind cover and phasers him right in the chest. And... Yeah, yeah. What happens is, unless Bradish were to spend two momentum, regular Bradish goes down onto the floor of the uh, DY100 and is effectively out of combat. What do you guys think? Should we spend it? Keep him up? It's worth spending it to keep him. Keep him. I think yeah. so. Otherwise, yeah. it's outnumbered. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd, let's do it. Let's spend it. All right, so maybe instead of falling flat onto his face, maybe he catches himself with a knee and rolls off into cover. Uh, but it is at this point we are going to go into full initiative order. Um, so I need to know who among the players would like to go next. Uh, and we'll basically go you guys, evil, you guys, <clears throat> evil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I, uh... I think Prawl would probably be the next one down after... Prawl, Prawl, or we have our Bradish, but either one. Mm -hmm. That's who I would vote for. All right. So yeah, Prawl, what is your uh, what is your take on what to do here? So maybe describe the corridor a little bit better. Um, it's almost like a a tube, like a full on cylinder, with basically recesses in the wall where you see what should have been sleeper beds, but you can now see that they have been emptied or otherwise cleaned out for a very long time. Um, the light is provided by some blinking LED strips in the ceiling. And I would say that the cylinder, the corridor itself, is large enough for four people to walk side by side, like shoulder to shoulder. Um, but there's also a bunch of debris, uh, fallen bulkheads, uh, bits of metal that have all been sort of arranged into very convenient barricades. Prowl's probably going to try and get down behind one of those barricades. Okay. Looking to see where Danny just ended up. All right. So let's say you rush forward and you get behind the same piece of cover that uh, Bradish is now behind. What just happened? Commander, I don't know how to describe it, but I saw myself shooting myself. You saw yourself shooting yourself. Yeah, it was another one of me. Oh, this doesn't bode well. <laughs> and he had a type 3 phaser. <laughs> I'm going to try and peek up, see if I can see anything. I would say based on their earlier role, you do not see the evil team. I'm uh, going to call back up to the shuttle. I think we have a problem here. What's going on? I heard phaser fire. If I am thinking what I am, are you familiar with this so-called mirror universe? Uh, a parallel dimensions, another version of ourselves, right? Living different lives. Danny just said he saw himself. And he f shot himself. Whatever this is, it sounds like we're under attack from people who look like us. We might want to stick together instead of spreading out. And what I would say is that that conversation will be your action for the turn. So we're going to go back to the evil players. So Bradish is already gone. Evil Bradish has... What is Evil Jensen? What is Evil Prawl? What is Evil Jaro doing? Uh, remember, any of you three can go. Hmm. I think, you know, 
we've we've sort of taken out one of their people, but now um, now Brawl is in our our sights. So I feel like we'd want to try and knock him out of commission as fast as as fast as possible. Also, Talayup is in chat. Hi, Talayup. Yes, you are missing the Mirror Universe episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I think that, um, I think that Mirror Jaro would want to shoot. Shoot. Uh, All right. I and think uh, who are you Jaro shooting? Is like, ha, I've been wanting to do this for a while now, but like, is is taking the opportunity. To take a shot at, at April. Okay. So yeah, uh, you're going to be shooting at Lieutenant Commander Prawl. Uh, so that's a control security difficulty of two for Jaro. You may have one of my threat to roll three dice. One and uh, difficulty is a two. And that means I get that threat right back. I love it. So uh, you are uh, rolling nine challenge die worth of damage. Now, Prawl, you are going to get covered challenge die. Don't worry. But we do need to see what the first, what the main damage is. Oh, my Lord. Uh, okay. So, Prawl, you have two challenge die worth of cover. So <laughs> it might be very important here for you to roll at least one. Okay, you've actually rolled three. So that's going to be a total of, because you are wearing an EV suit, that is a total of seven stress of damage, which is enough to injure you. You don't have momentum right now, which means you either spend threat or determination to stay up. I don't want to give you any more threat right now. Okay. <laughs> I, I can't that, imagine why. That's fair. <laughs> I don't know if I have any values that would work. I think it's one of those things where you don't actually have to tie staying up to a value. It's only for the classical, like you're doing a role that you have to apply a value. Or at least that's how yeah. I've always understood it. In that case, I'm going to go ahead and burn my determination to stay up. All righty. So you're still in the fight, but you have taken uh, seven stress worth of damage, which I believe puts you at five stress remaining. Uh, but I would simply point out that if Prawl takes another two injuries, he is dead dead, meaning that nothing will bring him back. So just so you're aware, we are in sort of that dangerous territory where you can kill yourself with yourself. It's confusing. <laughs> And then uh, I have a very important question. Does anybody on the evil side have quick to action? I, yeah. Uh, well, evil Jarl is going to use his evil quick to action. So Prawl or Jensen, what would you guys like to do? Evil uh, Prawl is going to disappear. He can do that. He's going to leave. Oh, okay. All right. He has other ideas. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, I think what that is is that unbeknownst to the rest of the evil team, Prawl just sort of vanishes into the darkness of the ship. But that does now go back to the regular player's turn. So huh. Jensen, uh, Prawl, uh, Jaro, or I guess probably you've already gone. So Jensen yeah, or Jaro, was... really? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna well. Um, I'm going to direct Bradish based on what I've seen from where the fire is, the, the, the fire is coming from. I want to try and, uh, direct where his attack would be best to expose mm. whoever's, whoever's striking at us. And, okay. On the defensive. and yeah, I would say that that would be on your part of presence command. Um, he would be rolling a control security. The difficulty would still be a two. So, so how does this work? I'm rolling one die or two die? You're rolling like a normal attack. So control security, difficulty two, two dice. And he is assisting you with presence command, only rolling one die. Can Bradish, does Bradish have to do exactly what he commands or can he have like a slight different idea? 
I mean, it has to be in the spirit of the idea. But what he do you wants have to mind? overcharge his phaser and chuck it like a grenade down Ooh. the hallway towards these guys and have it explode, revealing them, and mm -hmm. then allowing the rest of the group to sure. see who's there so they can yeah. direct their attacks. I think as long as it's like where I'm directing you. Yeah, like he's like, okay, he's gonna like overcharge, supercharge the phaser and chuck it like a grenade down the hall to either hurt them or just like distract them or something. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's you can do that. Well, he's like, aye, aye, commander. So uh, I'm screwing up control and security. Mm -hmm. Definitely have a focus. And you do have that assist from Jarl already. Focus, yes. Let's All go. right, three successes, which now means you uh, get one momentum. And yeah, Bradish, uh, type two phaser is three challenge die. So go ahead and roll me eight challenge die, please. Jarl, right. you got the uh, you got the momentum because yep. we're gonna we're gonna need it. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, ch eight challenge die, you said, sir. Yep. <sighs> Big money, no whammies. Where all right. Would you like to spend a momentum to reroll those zeros? Do it. Oop. Yes, do it. All right, let's do it. So I'm I'm, I'm uh, if you want to go and spend that, and then I'm rolling three. Yep. Technically, as many as you want, but... Boom. All right, so with seven, that is sufficient that when you throw your phaser bradish, uh, it overloads and gets high-pitched... The high-pitched whine grows louder and louder and louder as it arcs through the air and lands behind the cover where the evil versions of yourselves are lurking. And there's maybe that moment where evil Jensen and evil bradish share a look and then look down at the phaser and start mouthing something, and then the phaser detonates. And what I'm going to say is that Bradish, Evil Bradish, is completely knocked out, as is Evil Jensen. Yeah! yeah. All right. However, yeah. unbeknownst to you, Evil Jaro is still up. But good Jaro now has quick to action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Jaro, quick Let's to action. go! Get him! Uh, that means that um, I believe only... I haven't gone. You haven't gone yet. So so you're you're gonna get to go right now for mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause all right, let's see what I can do. <laughs> can I see him? Can I, I see would say based there? on the phaser blast that maybe it's even peeled away some of the cover that you do see someone that looks strikingly like Mr. Jaro behind a piece of cover. All right, uh, I mean uh yeah, yeah. I'll take my shot try and do my stuff let's well, stay undercover as much as i can too so noted all right uh so is this uh, control security yeah control it? security difficulty of two all right let's see what i can do <laughs> you're just now noticing that i flipped them yep freaking legend i just noticed that that's amazing <laughs> oh man all right uh returning I was originally going to go in and draw like goatees on them, but that was just taking too much time. Yeah. That would have been epic. That, <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> yeah. Right, that's so, an... <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, that's only one success. So I think Jaro would have, or Jensen, what happens is you peek out behind cover and fire your phaser, and it just goes sailing into the depths of the corridor, striking a panel down the way. Um, but at this point, we now go to a new turn, or sorry, a new round. And Evil Jaro, you have two individuals down. Brawl is nowhere to be seen. What does Evil Jaro do? I start with just like um, um, going to order Brawl to do something. And then he's not there. And it's, it's just like, that son of a bitch. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I love it. Um, I, at this point, lift my hands up and step out into the, into the open. Okay. Like, sirs, I believe there has been a misunderstanding here. And because I'm a son of a bitch, that's where we're going to end the session. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so oh, good. Yes. I double. Oh. 
Because so that I, I literally could not ask for a better cliffhanger than that. Yeah. And as you know, we have to end on a cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, yeah, you do. got me right there. The <laughs> yeah. Fire. Oh man, so good. So yeah, what did you guys think? Uh, did it work well? Like I know I kind of sprung that on you guys, but you guys seem to do pretty well with it. No, it was <laughs> that. That's good stuff right there. Very good. Good twist. Too Didn't see too it much coming. evil laughter on my part, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. No, I love. Uh, I love the chat picked up. Evil Prawl is going to disappear. Elh, he could do. That. <laughs> <laughs> he could do that. Oh lord! It was but, yeah. fun. It was really fun to fight against ourselves. In all seriousness, yeah. like it yeah. was cool. Um, I just like that the fact that we said no, we don't need those type three phases. Yeah, evil don't cells need them are at like, all. Evil cells are like, yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> We're all standing there with our type three phasers. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that was so difficult because I was like, I know we're walking into an ambush. It's mm -hmm. really. That, yeah, that, that yeah I got to give you guys kudos. You did not metagame it, which was great. No, so I definitely have to give you mm -hmm. kudos for that. But Sounds yeah. like walking into next session with some free momentum for not metagaming. Yeah, you know go. what? A lot. Someone note down you have two momentum. There you go. Good. Don't ask. You don't get it. If you don't That's ask. Right. You don't get it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> excellent all righty so oh, uh while we're on stream i do want to confirm is everybody good for the 19th always yes okay then we will be back on uh, september 19th uh until then uh thank you so much for tuning in stream we'll see part two of this episode then until then live long and prosper cheers <laughs>